SFC 카렌 샌들러 변호사님께서 오픈 소스 분쟁의 새로운 쟁점이라는 주제로 발표를 해 주실 텐데요. 자, 이번 순서는요. 여러분 특별히 영상으로 함께 만나 보시겠습니다. Hi. I'm Karen Sandler. I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. I'm here to talk to you today about the Software Freedom Conservancy versus Vizio lawsuit. Before we start uh, talking about the lawsuit, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am, um, I have a big heart. Um, I say that jokingly, but I literally have a thick heart. Um, the condition is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I am totally fine. I'm generally asymptomatic, but I am at a very high risk of suddenly dying. And um, it's okay because I have a pacemaker defibrillator implanted in my body. When I was diagnosed with this condition and told that I needed a device, my first question was about the software on the device. I wanted to understand how the device worked. And what I discovered, which won't be a surprise to many of you watching this, is that the software on my device was closed and proprietary. And even though this device and thus its software was being implanted in my body and literally screwed into my heart and sewn into my body, I could not see the source code. Um, as an engineer turned lawyer, um, I found that deeply disturbing and um, launched a, a research initiative to study the safety and efficacy of these devices. Um, and through that process, um, I became convinced that the only way that we will um, be able to have confidence in our technology is if we have transparency related to that technology. And so I became very committed to working in free and open source software from a community perspective, from a public good perspective. Um, and I, um, I became involved with um, multiple free and open source software projects and wound up uh, ultimately at Software Freedom Conservancy as its executive director. Um, that is why I run the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, it's not just about my defibrillator, it's about all of the software we rely on, it's about all of our critical software, and it's very difficult to know which software will be critical at which time. We run an initiative called Outreachy, which is um, centered around providing paid remote internship opportunities to people who are subject to systemic bias and who are impacted by underrepresentation, because if our software isn't made by everyone, it won't be made for everyone. We, um, we act as a fiscal sponsor and we help support alternatives to proprietary software so that, um, uh, so that we have alternatives um, that are viable. And then lastly, we um, defend and promote copyleft. Copyleft software are of course, those free and open source software licenses that are forever free, that require, um, that have sharing provisions that require um, uh, the provision of source code. And so the developers that release their software under these licenses have done so in many cases for ideological purposes. They, um, they choose that license because they want their software to stay free. They want to be able to know that if they work at another company, they'll be able to uh, use that same software. They want to share that software. And, um, and in many cases, um, m many of these projects have a very deep ideological underpinning from how they were founded, even though many of those pieces of software are also um, very important commercially. Um, and so where Software Freedom Conservancy comes in is that um, we monitor um, uh, the usage of copyleft licenses, and we take reports in from members of the public who tell us when they um, when they see violations, especially when there is um, something that they want to do with that software that they they can't. Um, and we started out doing this because um, there was a coalition of Linux kernel developers who um, who approached us and asked us to help them enforce their licenses. Um, and so, of course. Uh, we stepped up, they were so frustrated that, um, and remain frustrated, the members of our coalition, that companies in our space don't follow the licenses um, and uh, that they've asked us to step up in this space. And what we found is that if there's nobody sort of standing up for these licenses, then they may as well not have those reciprocal provisions to begin with. So um, we have a coalition. We 
allow people to participate participate in the coalition uh, by being publicly anonymous about their participation. That's very important because uh, some of the people who have participated in our coalition have found that companies have tried to pressure them to not participate in our um, in our coalition. And so um, I can't tell you everybody who's in our coalition, although some of the um, developers in our coalition have been very vocal about being there. But of course, we enforce for the public good. We don't look to enforce the terms of the GPL to shake down companies or to try to get a windfall of cash. Uh, we enforce our uh, we enforce the licenses with principles because we want to make sure that everyone has access to the source code that they should have access to and that they're able to do the things with their products and their software that they have a right to do. And so we codified our principles of GPL enforcement um, uh, in, a, in a document where we tell people that the ways that we enforce um, are, are according to these principles so that people know that we think that someone who is violating the license today could be a contributor tomorrow. Um, and the way that we do it is, and here's a list of those principles that we follow, our primary goal is compliance. Our goal is not to make money. Our goal is not to be annoying. Our goal is to get companies into compliance that you, I'm here talking to you about a lawsuit, but um, legal action is our last resort. We have no intention of bringing lawsuits uh, where they're unnecessary. When companies refuse to um, comply, we, um, we have no choice but to bring lawsuits. Um, we do try uh, diplomatic um, uh, means first, of course, and try to talk to companies about their, um, their compliance. Um, so it all starts with the report. As I said, we get emails, um, hundreds of emails from people who are trying to do generally awesome things with their products, with their equipments, with the things that they buy or the things that they're using. Um, and people contact us when they're really frustrated because they see that there is copylefted software in a product and there is no, um, you know, and there's no source code or they, they simply, um, you know, the, they, they can't there's no offer they can't figure out how to get in touch with a company um and so uh we get so many reports we can't pursue them all but um but we do our best and um and we keep in mind where these reports are coming from because it is about it is about something that people are 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 trying to do um you know with the with with their own things that they have a right to do so you know, we we generally have to be somewhat formal in our communications, but our goal is to contact people who are active in our space, people who are, if, if the company is active in the free and open source software communities, those are the people we generally contact first to help them, um, to, to let them know that this is happening and then to enlist their help. Um, and usually those advocates are extremely effective in uh, helping us get a conversation going at their companies. Um, now, I put this quote on the slide because uh, this is a, a, a quote from uh, GPL version 2, um, because what we are looking for is the complete and corresponding source code. And people often say, well, what does that mean exactly? And so uh, there's a very clear definition in the license, and the complete, in, the complete source code means all the source code for all modules it contains, plus the scripts to use to control compilation and installation of the executable. I just wanted to highlight that because I think uh, some people uh, miss that clause when they um, when they read the license. Um, so this brings us to the case at hand, which is um, uh, which is the Visio suit. So with Visio, um, we as we said, we first tried to operate through diplomacy. Um, we raised the issue of non-compliance uh, with uh, the copyleft license in in August of 2018, and after a year of discussion, Visio was still refusing to comply. And then, in January of 2020, Visio simply stopped responding to our inquiries about its compliance. And then, by July of 2021, the model that we originally complained about. Um, as being non-compliant was discontinued. And then when we purchased new models, we found that despite all of our efforts, they still had no source code included with the device, nor any offer for the source code. 
So they basically people buying these models would never know that there was anything special about the software in these devices or that they had any rights at all with connected to the software on the TVs. So the offer for source um, that is missing provides a really important um, uh, function in um, is, is actually quite important um, because it tells people that there is something special about this software that in fact the um, uh, that in fact there there is such a thing as copyleft licensing that the GPL is a license and that people have rights with respect to their software for many people the offer for source is the very first time they hear about anything about free and open source software licensing and in particular uh, the GPL and copyleft and so this is an extremely important component and requirement of the license um, and one that um, that was fl flagrantly um, violated by Vizio there was uh, no sourcer or offer for source with these TVs it was very frustrating and so um, we had uh, we had we had no choice um, but to uh, bring a lawsuit um, uh, it was clear that they had not listened to us and worse still um, instead of listening to us and making changes and improving their systems and coming into compliance um, years had passed and instead they weren't even doing uh, they, were, they weren't doing anything for compliance and so um, we filed a, um, a lawsuit um, uh, in uh, in Orange County in California um, which is different than many of the um, lawsuits that have been filed in the past for um, in this field um, over copyleft licenses most importantly we filed as a third-party beneficiary um, under US law third-party beneficiary law is a very um, well-established um, uh, it's it, it the, the third party beneficiary rights are well established rights under contract law, um, and if you look at um, the uh, GPL licenses, well, that's like that's a rep repetitive thing. Uh, if you look at the GPLs, as the slide says, the GP the the um, the licenses, you'll see that um, that the licenses specifically give rights to people who receive the software downstream, and so I have a few quotes from it. Um, so in section 2b it even uses the term third parties which is to say uh, you know you may you must cause any work that you distribute or publish um, that in whole or in part contains or is derived from the program or any part thereof to be licensed as a whole at no charge to all third parties under the terms of this license and then further um, there's uh, there's other language in the license that says uh, if you distribute copies of such a program um, you must make sure that they, referring to recipients, uh, so it says you must give the recipients all the rights you have, and you must make sure that they too receive or can get the source code, and you must show them these terms so that they know their rights, or so they know their rights. Um, so, you know, I, like, the license is very clear about the, that it gives rights and intends to give rights to third parties, um, and more importantly, it makes sense because customers are actually the ones who can figure out, like are, they're the ones who see whether a company is compliant with compliance with a license because they're the ones receiving the products. They're the ones who are interacting with the company and they're in the position to know whether or not a company is compliant. From a developer's perspective or a free software project contributor perspective, once they contribute to their project and let that, you know, and, and, and publish their source code, they've done so under a license that they intend to be freely shared. And those, um, those copyright holders are not necessarily, you know, not, they're, they're not necessarily monitoring every use of their software. Um, you know, part of the point of releasing it under a free license is to let it be shared very, very widely and used very, very widely. And so the customers are actually in many ways better positioned to know who is in, um, you know, which companies are out of compliance. And, um, and, and also they're the ones that are actually in need of all of this technical information that allows them to make modifications to the software, um, you know, which is what the licenses are, are providing for and anticipating. Um, it's the, it's the customers who actually want to do something with the software. And so they need it so they can modify it. 
Now, in the Vizio case, um, another another way in which this suit is different than other lawsuits is that um, it's not just a lawsuit over the Linux kernel or over uh, BusyBox, which had previously suits have been focused on one project. As a third-party beneficiary, there are many different um, software projects that are at issue, all with no source or offer for source. Um, and this is a list of some of the relevant GPLv2 software. And this is the relevant, uh, some of the relevant LGPLV2.1 software. Um, so there are quite a number of free software projects that are used in the Vizio's TVs for which there was no source or offer for source. Now, I keep saying there, this, this is another way that the, this suit is, uh, is somewhat uh, unusual historically, um, but, uh, but this is, there's another, uh, another way in which this suit is interesting and a little bit different is that, as I said in the, um, the principles of GPL, and of, of community-oriented GPL enforcement, um, you know, our goal for enforcement is not monetary. So um, our goal is compliance. And so in this particular suit, we were able to show that directly because as a possible remedy under contract or something you can ask for when there's a, 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 a you know, when there's a, a violation of contractual terms is for specific performance, which, um, which means that um, you can ask for something in particular. And there is a, um, a very um, significant body of law in the United States about specific performance and uh, around property um, uh, when that property is unique. And so in this instance, we have not asked for um, any monetary damages, but instead we have asked for the complete and corresponding source code for those Vizio TVs, because that is what we need. Um, uh, that, that, is, that is actually the thing that we want um, to come out of this suit. Um, so, uh, we filed this, um, this lawsuit and, uh, Vizio's response was not to provide complete and corresponding source code, um, but was instead to remove the case to federal court. Now in the United States, um, we have, uh, you know, the each, each, there's state court and there's federal court and, um, and the way that it, it works is that if, uh, if you think that, a, a a, um, an issue is a claim is preempted by a federal argument, you can remove the suit to federal court. So a preemption argument um, in particular um, can apply to, um, to copyright. And so, um, uh, and so uh, in this case, uh, what Vizio said was that, uh, in fact, this case was, um, was filed as a, for, was, was filed in state court for um, under contract law for a third party beneficiary, but because it's connected and related to a, um, a copyright license, this is clearly covered by copyright. And so it should go to the federal court. Uh, it was, uh, and then they at the same time or right after filed a motion to dismiss saying that because Software Freedom Conservancy had not asserted copyright claims that, um, that in fact, because the, the, issue belongs in federal court and is a copyright issue and not a contract issue, then it should be, um, it should, it should be dismissed, um, which was, uh, 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 I'll just say very clever, uh, very clever reasoning. Um, and, uh, and so, um, uh, we had quite a number of filings, uh, going back and forth about it. Um, you know, from our part, showing the body of law in the United States, um, and in particular, um, you know, under under uh, relevant jurisdictions in the United States, showing that in fact these uh, these license agreements work as licenses and agreements, and that there are uh, contract claims and copyright claims um, that uh, that uh, come to play. And so there was a uh, a hearing before the federal judge, which I have to say was just um, really interesting. And amazing to watch uh, just a really uh, smart judge ask really insightful questions. Um, well, we've requested a transcript and um, hope to be able to publish that. Um, and so uh, on uh, May 13th, uh, Judge Staten um, published a, um, a ruling 
in which um, she said she she granted our motion to remand. Um, so we had to put in a motion to send it back to state courts. So basically in the United States, the way it works is that if there's a removal motion, it gets automatically removed to federal court. And then the um, uh, if you want, if the um, the plaintiff wanted to uh wanted to send it back to state court, then you had to, we had to file a motion to remand. And so uh, the judge granted Software Freedom Conservancy's um, motion to remand, um, saying that the enforcement of an additional contractual promise separate and distinct from any rights provided by the copyright laws amounts to an extra element and therefore the claims are not preempted. Um, so now we're at the point where um, we're back in state court and the um, the state court proceedings will commence. So, um, you know, in a way, uh, we're back at the beginning, but we have this very uh, powerful remand ruling from the um, from the federal judge. Uh, so we'll we'll you know that like it's uh, uh, legal actions in the United States, and I understand uh, elsewhere um, can take a very long time and uh, and be winding. Uh, but uh, it's been very interesting and. Um, uh, uh, encouraging to see how um, how things have gone so far. Now, this isn't just some theoretical esoteric issue, right? This picture is just some random picture of a TV repair shop. Do you remember when there were repair shops? I mean, some of you might be uh, too young to remember that, but TV repair shops used to be very, very common. And people were able to repair their own TVs, or they were able to go to people locally to have their TVs repaired. And that that is no longer the case as smart TVs have become prevalent and um, and the the software has become such a big portion of the TV's operation TVs are now just computers and they rely on their manufacturers because they rely on software that locks people in having proprietary software on these on televisions uh, locks people in and 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 often for nefarious purposes there have been cases that have shown that TV companies in particular have been spying on their customers um, uh, and, and users. And, um, and in fact, uh, even Vizio was involved in a large class action suit that alleged that they were misusing customers' private information. Um, there are quite a lot of reasons why people would want access to their, um, their, their source, code, source code on their televisions, whether it's for accessibility reasons or just to be able to hire whoever they want to be able to repair it. But of course, they can't do any of those things without the complete and corresponding source code, including the scripts to control um, installation. And um, just to further uh, discuss, like further demonstrate how this isn't theoretical, a similar thing happened in the router space. And so, if you look at the uh, the OpenWRT project, that was a project that was started through GPL enforcement and a GPL enforcement action, and is now a vibrant project and is widely used on routers. Uh, uh, even um, our uh, one of our less technical lawyers had told me that she had put uh, OpenWRT on her router. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's it's a wonderful project. It's also a, a member project of Software Freedom Conservancy, um, and um, you know, we're we're proud to support these alternatives because um, they're so important. And and by having um, a project that allows reinstallation of software on these devices, it actually worked out really well in a way for um, for router manufacturers because often router manufacturers are ensuring that their routers uh, conform to the specs of to be used with OpenWRT because that means that there's a, a market of people who are looking for these routers and they actually have a much longer shelf life. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening to uh, this talk. 네, 카렌 샌들러님의 발표를 영상으로 함께 만나보셨습니다. 어, 지금 카렌 샌들러님이 온라인으로 접속을 하고 계신데요. 자, 만나 뵙기 전에 여러분 혹시 현장에서 또 질문하실 분이 혹시 계실까요? 손을 한번 들어주시겠어요? 아, 네, 알겠습니다. 자, 그러면 바로 어, 지금 온라인으로 접속을 하고 계십니다. 우리 카렌 샌들러님 좀 힘든 시간을 보내셨는데요. 한번 불러보도록 하겠습니다. 어, 카렌 샌들러님 혹시 제 목소리가 지금 들리실까요? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello. 아, 네. 네, 잘 들립니다. 안녕하십니까? 자, 그러면 발표 내용을 토대로 저희가 질문을 좀 드리도록 하겠습니다. 지금부터 질문하는 내용에 답변을 좀 부탁드리겠습니다. 
어, 연방 법원이 이 사건을 기각하지 않고 주 법원으로 환송을 했다는 것은 F, SFC의 조작을 모두 받아들였다고 보기보다는 단순히 사건이 연방 법원에 적절하지 않고 따라서 기각할 근거도 없기 때문에 환송을 했다고 볼수 있습니다. 때문에 앞으로 이 소송은 복잡하고 큰 비용이 들어갈 것으로 보여서 사실 이번 소송으로 소비자의 권리가 제대로 증명될 수 있을지 아직은 잘 모르겠습니다. 특히나 대부분의 GPL 소송은 대개 합의로 해결되는 경우가 많았는데 그렇다면 SFC도 비지오와 적정한 선에서 합의할 계획이 있는지 만약에 그렇다면 소비자의 권리 주장의 근거가 되지 못하는 건 아닌지 이 부분이 궁금하다라는 질문이었거든요. 답을 좀 부탁드리겠습니다. That's... 정말 재미있는 질문을 주셨네요. 제가 이렇게 답변을 드리고 싶어요. 연방정부가 이제 소송을 환송을 했죠. 이 소환송은 이제 그 연방정부의 성격에 맞지 않는다라고 얘기를 하셨고 그래서 이거에 관해서 어떠한 관련자들에 대해서 빠른 행동 조치를 취할 수 있도록 해 주었습니다. 그런 이유로 이제 주 정부와 주 법정으로 다시 송환이 되었습니다. 이걸 조금 더 분명하게 정리를 좀 하고 싶어요. 그리고 저희 내용들 지금까지 나와 있는 것들 보면요. 제가 사실 계속 진행되고 있는 거라서 완전히 다 확정적인 답변을 드리기는 조금 어렵습니다만 기본적으로 여기에 GPL의 그 원칙을 보시면 지금 저희가 완전히 이 소스 코드를 공개하는 것을 계속 요구하고 있습니다. 그게 저희의 궁극적인 목표입니다. 그래서 저희가 요구하는 건 분명히 처음부터 명시가 되어 있었습니다. 그래서 우리가 계속 모두 만족하기 위해서 궁극적으로 추구하는 것은 소스 코드의 완전한 공개입니다. 그래서 그것을 끝까지 얻어내기 위한 노력을 계속 할 것입니다. 잘 알겠습니다. 자, 다시 한번 현장에 계신 분들께서는 지금 통역 리시보로 듣고 계신 거죠. 1번으로 맞춰주시면 네, 공문으로 함께 들으실 수가 있겠습니다. 어, 그렇습니다. 사실 이렇게 쉽지 않은 소송 상황에서 소비자의 권리를 증명하기 위한 SFC의 현실적인 계획이 어, 이번에는 좀 무엇인지 궁금하다라는 질문이 들어왔고요. 그러면서 아주 강하게 온 마음을 다해서 응원합니다라는 어, 글도 좀 덧붙여 주셨습니다. 이에 대한 답을 좀 부탁드리겠습니다. 정말 감사합니다. 네, 그렇게 저희의 공감해 주셔서 너무 감사합니다. 사실 쉽진 않습니다. 저희가 이첫 번째로 소송을 하는 것도 쉽지 않았고요. 또 많은 사람들이 이것을 보면서 어떻게 보면 이 회사에게 어떻게 보면 BGO라는 그 회사가 조금 어, 명예가 훼손이 되는 그런 거라고 볼 수도 있잖아요. 좀 아, 면이 서지 않는 그런 것인데 저희는 사실 그 회사를 공격한다라기보다는 많은 회사들이 BGO뿐만 아니라 많은 회사들이 이 소비자들이 직접 쓰게 되는 소비자들이 소유하고 있는 물건에 대해서 그 권한을 확보를 해줘야 된다라고 생각하고 있기 때문에 저희가 시작을 한 것이었습니다. 개인들이 많은 회사들이 이제 많이 저희에 대해서 같은 의견을 가지고 고 기부도 해주시고 많이 응원을 해주셔서 정말 감사드리는데요. 한국에서도 저희 케이스에 대해서 관심을 갖고 또 응원해주시는 것을 알고 나니까 더 힘이 납니다. 감사합니다. 네, 우리 카렌 샌들러님의 큰 뜻이 잘 전해지기를 바라고요. 힘든 과정 잘 이겨내기를 저희도 여기서 응원하는 마음을 좀 보내드리도록 하겠습니다. 오늘 함께 해주셔서 감사합니다. Thanks so much. 네, 대단히 감사합니다. 보내주십시오. 네, 고맙습니다. 아, 굉장히 흥미로운 질문과 또 훌륭한 답변까지 잘 들었습니다.